Nathaniel, Mark, and Gene Abel. Nathaniel, uh, Mark, and Gene Abel visiting professorship in pediatric orthopedics. This was a uh, professorship that uh, myself and several faculty members and alumni started in order in honor of Dr. Abel, our, our chief of peds ortho for a very long time, pediatric spine surgeon, as well as chair of our department uh, prior to me. Uh, Dr. Abel uh, has made uh, countless uh, contributions to this department uh, from an education standpoint, leadership standpoint, uh, and uh, just help grow the foundation and build a strong foundation of this department and what we have today. So this uh, lectureship was uh, established in his honor uh, to support pediatric uh, orthopedic uh, visiting professors, pediatric orthopedic research, uh, and uh, support a resident interested in pediatric orthopedics uh, for educational conferences. So this is the 10th uh, year. So I'm very excited uh, to uh, have Dr. Romanus, our division head, uh, present our, our speaker, who we had a wonderful time with last night uh, with case presentations and with the Peds Ortho Division and Chief Resident. So turning it over to Dr. Mm -hmm. Romanus. Yeah, so it's, it's my honor to introduce uh, Dr. Dan Sicato. He visited us again previously about 10 years ago, so it's kind of appropriate that he's back for the uh, ABLE lectureship as well. Um, to say he's a leader is, you know, doesn't give him enough credit, uh, but he's actually one of the foundational members in the pediatric orthopedic world, uh, and that's exemplified by his current role. He's chief of staff at the Scottish Rite Hospital in Dallas. And for those of you that aren't familiar with Scottish Rite, it's, it's kind of one of the premier pediatric orthopedic uh, hospitals and medical centers in the country. Uh, they have, um, I was trying to count off the website, at least 25 uh, pediatric orthopedists um, involved with the team and all the specialties are covered. They're also nationally, internationally known uh, for all the subspecialties within pediatric orthopedics. So again, it's, it's just an amazing place. Um, they do great educational stuff, great clinical stuff and great research stuff, which is, as we know, is you know the three stool legs of UVA as well. Um, his training uh, was through Buffalo for med school residency. Then he did his residency at Scottish Rite and then stayed on and has been a leader there. And now, as I said, uh, chief of staff for that. So it's awesome to have him come visit again, and we'll have some talks on uh, his leadership roles, as well as we'll have a second talk uh, dealing with hips, which gets down to the point why we love having him here, because his main areas of uh, focus are spine and hip, so it reflects what Dr. Bachman and I do as well. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah. That one first. Am I, is this microphone go up? There it is. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Dr. Romnitz. It's an uh, absolute uh, honor to be here. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, I've been in Dallas for 25 years. And so when uh, I was very honored that Dr. Bachman asked me to be a visiting professor here, and, uh, and I said to myself, what am I going to talk about to residents and fellows? And you know, once you've been in practice 25 years, you have a few thoughts. And so instead of talking about spine and hip, I thought I would give you some, some of my thoughts. And, and this could be very interactive. And I may ask some of the residents some questions, which I know you guys love. So um, it's an honor, especially to be here because of uh, Dr. Abel. And I don't, I don't need to tell you about Dr. Abel and his uh, stature in the world of pediatric orthopedics, but he's one of the uh, folks that I respect uh, the most uh, for a lot of things, including the fact that he's always honest and he's always uh, transparent, as you guys probably know. And uh, he tells it uh, the way it is, but it all comes from the heart. And I think that's really, really important. So the last time I was here, you know, I, we had a little fun. And so Mark said, listen, um, why don't you get here a little early and we'll kind of do have some fun and we'll go on a, maybe we'll go on a bike ride. And I said, okay, well, I, I biked a fair amount when I was a little younger. And so, and I know his reputation. So he's like, do you want to go on the short ride or the long ride? And I said, well, let's, well, what's, what's the short ride? He told me what the short ride was. I said, well, let's do the short ride. So uh, near the end of the ride, I was about a mile behind him and finally got back to his house where, where we finished up. And I said, Mark, what happened? He's like, I think we took the wrong turn. We ended up doing the long ride. I'm like, oh, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. So, <laughs> 
So that was my introduction to Dr. Abel. So um, just for completeness sake, I get a little bit of royalties from Globus. Uh, so this is your team and I uh, appreciate, uh, and uh, so, uh, this is off the website. And so this is uh, only part of your team, I assume, because uh, Dr. Chabra told me that you, he's hired quite a few surgeons since he started. And so, uh, you know, teams are really, really important. And obviously Dr. Chabra is a great leader uh, and you have leaders throughout uh, and uh, the PEDS folks I know very well and are great people and great leaders. And so this was my talk in May, I dug this up, 2012, May of uh, 8th and 9th of 2012, where I gave grand rounds. And so uh, I just become the chief in January of 2012. And so I was four months into it and uh, uh, I gave this talk on hip preservation surgery. And this used to be our sort of slide and now our slide moniker is a little bit different. So uh, as Mark said, we're, I come from Dallas and uh, Scottish Rite. Uh, when I went and interviewed for my fellowship, I knew it was the place for me. And I was going to go there and then I was going to go back to the Northeast where I basically lived my whole life. And they asked me to stay and I've been there ever since. And so you never know where life will turn, uh, take a turn. And, and so it's been a dream job for me. And it's been uh, just an absolute pleasure to, to work there and, and be part of the team. And uh, Scottish Rite started many years ago, over 100 years ago. Our birthday was uh, 1920. Uh, the birth of the hospital was 1921. And W.B. Carroll was the first orthopedic surgeon in Dallas. And he had this small office which now uh, sits on that uh, property is uh, our hospital, but uh, he was the first orthopedist. And on Saturdays, he was taking care of children who had polio, manifestations of polio as an orthopedic condition. And it, it got to be so uh, busy that he ended up uh, getting together with some friends and uh, they uh, raised enough funds to build a hospital. And the hospital sat on land and you can see uh, this is uh, Scottish right there in the circle, and you can see Parkland Hospital and Southwest Medical Center at the time. And this was what the hospital looked like in 1978. It got torn down, and this is uh, as they're tearing it down uh, to build the, the Dallas campus. And so this is our Dallas campus, and it sits in the heart of Dallas, and it's about 14 acres uh, with prime real estate, and it's been a great place. And we also have a Frisco campus, which we built 20, uh, five years ago. It's 22 miles north of um, Dallas proper and it's probably the fastest growing community in the country uh, and it's an ambulatory surgical center and so uh, over the last five years that that uh, practice has been blown and going and it's probably our it is our fastest growing practice and so uh, just as a testament to Dr. Abel I looked up a few things and uh, this was seven quick questions that you answered in 2015 um, and it's really a uh, phenomenal uh, if you go through these seven questions. And you can see there on the last line, all my heroes demonstrate tenacity, dedication, and a morality in the face of adversity. And I think that what that's what at least partly defines Dr. Abel. So again, it's an honor to be here. So at our place, we have five fellows uh, uh, and uh, it's been a great uh, education is obviously incredibly important in teaching the next generation. And for the folks who are sitting in seats uh, as residents, uh, it, you're obviously incredibly talented and you wouldn't be an orthopedic resident if you weren't talented. And, and this talk is really about uh, things I've learned, but really being uh, taking advantage of the full opportunity that you have. Uh, and in today's world, there's huge opportunities to, to really uh, master your craft and be a great orthopedic surgeon. Uh, these are our three facilities. Uh, so the Dallas campus is pictured to the right. Uh, fellows spend time up at our Frisco campus. And then on the bottom left, left is Children's Health, which is uh, down the street from our main campus. Uh, and that's where we do acute orthopedics. And we run orthopedics over there. And Christine Ho is the chair, is the uh, director of the orthopedic care there. And this uh, alluded to our team. This is our team. And so we got a big pediatric orthopedic team. Uh, and we're very fortunate to live in a busy place, uh, high population. And so it's grown since I started uh, when we when I was a seventh orthopedic surgeon. And now we have 23 orthopedic surgeons. So when I give a talk on something specific on hip and spine, I realize that most people aren't really that interested in that. And it's such a niche practice that it probably doesn't really uh, pertain to uh, everybody. And so I always start with this slide and always say that if you remember nothing else, just remember this, and this is really for the residents. It's really a privilege to get to do what we do. And so take it to heart, be a good doctor first. I mean, I think uh, each, each, you know, we're surgeons, but be a good doctor first. And someone once said, if you're a good doctor, the patient will tell you what's wrong with them. And so I think that's really important. A good history and good physical, old school medicine is really important. Master your craft. Uh, you as residents are being asked to do things uh, that uh, I was never asked to do as a resident. I mean, for spine, for example, we're doing many more 
uh, invasive uh, osteotomies and pedicle screws. And when I started uh, as a resident, even as a fellow, we were using hooks, rarely doing osteotomies. And so the technical side of things is uh, more strenuous today than it's ever been. Uh, always try to do the right thing. That's really challenging at times, especially as a young surgeon. Uh, going against the grain and doing the right thing when everybody in the room wants to kind of uh, continue on with the case and you need to stop the case because it's the right thing, that's the right thing to do. In spine deformity, for example, and you have neuromonitoring changes that don't make any sense. And complications will happen. We'll talk a little bit about this. It's really not that important. You obviously avoid them almost at all costs, but when they happen, it's really the next step. There are steps that really are important, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So I have eight uh, things that I'm going to talk about that I've learned through 25 years. And there's many more, but I thought I'd uh, talk about these. So be grateful for the opportunity. I mean, we live in a privileged world. And this is a, not a patient of mine, but this is a very compelling story of John Michael, who has an underlying uh, neuromuscular condition, uh, has uh, some disabilities. And here is his family and his parents. And they, he wasn't a patient of mine. But one time he came in and we hung him up in a halo gravity traction, which we do a lot at our place. It was developed by one of our engineers, a spring-loaded device. And I was uh, at the elevator, and I got to know the dad just because they were there a long time. And I was up on the floor several times when he was there. And I said, how are things going? He says, this place is great. He's like, we couldn't get this anywhere else. And I thought for sure he was talking about the halo gravity traction because it was developed by our, uh, one of our engineers, and we do a lot of it. Uh, and I said, oh, yeah, the halo gravity, you know, we developed that 10 years ago, and it's been a great thing and you know a lot of places can't do it because of their setup and so we're really have the privilege to, privilege to do it and he's like no that's not why what i'm talking about you gave us something that we couldn't get anywhere else and that is hope and uh, and that's what patients come to us for it sounds a little corny but it's really true and so john Mark, michael came to us and hung him up in traction and this is him post-op and so he did great and so here's a story that his uncle and aunt talked And you could easily insert UVA in that, right? Any institution could do what we did, but uh, it's a privilege to get to do what we do. And so be grateful for that opportunity. Number two, have a plan. So you guys are all planning your careers, and uh, but have a plan. Sit down and think about it. Sometimes we're, as orthopedic surgeons, we like to do a lot of things. We don't sometimes sit down and, get, and make a plan, but make a plan and, and really think about what you want to do over time. And that means maybe sitting down with your computer or sitting down and taking notes and, and really outlining the plan and determine what is your end goal. Sometimes that's hard to do. Like what's your end goal at the end of residency? What's your end goal at the end of next year? And then reverse engineer your activities and your actions to really meet that goal. And sometimes that's very diff difficult. And so uh, match your uh, actions with your ambition. If your ambition is to be here, but your actions are not there, then, then you're not going to get to that goal. And I think having a plan is really important. And so famous author said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And so that's, if you really think about that, that's really important. Michael Porter, the famous uh, Harvard business uh, professor said, the essence of strategy is choosing what not to do. And that's just as important as saying, uh, as knowing what to do. And so when you're young in your career, I, my, viewpoint is you should almost always say yes. Can you give this talk? Yes. Can you see this patient? Yes. You know, the answer should be yes. But as time goes on, you only have so much time and bandwidth. And so you have to figure out when to say no. And that's really important. And so talking about strategic plans, and I know many in the audience have participated in strategic plans, but think about the strategic plan for yourself and your career and your family life and your uh, personal life. What are the things you, you want to achieve and how do you want to achieve it? Uh, and you really want to start with the question of why, and the why is the most important part. Why do you exist and what is your focus? Uh, because that's really important as time goes on. The strategy helps to establish priorities, choose actions, create a plan, allocate resources, and be proactive. And being proactive is really important. Don't be reactive. Try to be proactive in your plan. And anytime you talk about strategic plans, this is sort of the pyramid that you talk about it at the top is the vision, vision and the mission uh, of usually organizations. But think about it. Uh, for yourself. What is your vision and what is your mission and how are you going to get there and de 
develop some uh, action plans to get there. The vision, of course, is what does success look like? What does success look like for you as an individual uh, in your personal life, in your family, in your uh, professional life? And really that's uh, at the top. And the why is incredibly important. Why do we exist? You know, what is our purpose? And so this is a very famous book, Simon Sinek, and he had a YouTube video that went viral in this sort of golden circle. And at the, at the center of the golden circle is the why. What is our purpose? Uh, why do we do what we do? And uh, think about that. You know, why or why do we do a pediatric? Why? What's our essence as a pediatric orthopedic uh, a surgeon? And it's really to give the very best to uh, each and every child that we interact with. And uh, uh, Nietzsche, the famous philosopher, said, "He who has a why can withstand any how." In other words, if you have a why, you can, no matter how, it, whatever it takes to get there, uh, and all the things that come about. It's uh, the, those are the things that you can withstand because your why is so, so important. And this is our mission for kids, for pediatric orthopedics. This is our mission. I'm trying to put those kids at the center of what we do and stay laser focused on them and their families is really important. It's not that easy. Oftentimes, it's sometimes very, very difficult. But this is our mission. And so in any strategic plan, this sort of the circle. And if you think about this, this could be uh, thinking about this for your life. Assess your, yourself, develop a vision and a mission, assess the environment that you work in, agree on the priorities, write it all down. And writing it down is not that easy. It doesn't have to be super complex. It could be a small little post-it that you write down uh, your plan, implement, monitor, and evaluate, and then just reassess. And we do this every day. And this is not that, uh, this is not uh, um any secret, and this is very straightforward stuff. And this is probably one of the most important articles I've ever read. And this, this is the nine organization imperatives. This is by McKinsey. And if you ever get any opportunity to kind of spend some time with the McKinsey folks, they, they're incredibly expensive, but uh, they have a lot of uh, important things. And you can get their website on their website. They have a lot of nice write, writings. Um, and so these are the nine imperatives that they came up with. And right at the center is taking a stance on purpose. And uh, what is your why? And use your culture as your secret sauce. And this, you could feel the culture last night of this uh, institution and, and what's been built here. And it's really important uh, to have a culture of inclusivity and, um, and uh, diversity and all the things that make organizations work very well. And sharpen your value agenda. What do you bring to the table? What is your value? And bringing, bringing value to whoever the audience is is really important. SWOT analysis is just very straightforward things, but think about this as an individual. What are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? I personally think that we have all been gifted with a handful of things and everything else we're not that good at. And so I think we all have some strengths and we've been gifted with those strengths, but we also have weaknesses. So surround yourself with people who uh, can take advantage uh, of their strengths uh, to build a great team. Uh, and setting priorities, how can we be most effective? And this is a, is a very straightforward impact effort grid. And so if you could spend your time all in the green box, that would be great. High impact that are easy to do. Those things are not that common. The more, yellow, the more common things are in the yellow boxes and you never want to spend any time in the red. They're low impact, they're very difficult to do and try to stay away from those boxes and try to figure out those. So number three is do your homework and master your craft. Again, getting back to orthopedic surgery, it is not easy what you're being asked to do, but take your time, study, uh, and master your craft. And, and so uh, it's really important that each case you learn from uh, to the max, even if you're not doing the case, watching, asking questions, listening, preparing, you only have so many opportunities to be in the operating room as a resident and a fellow if you do a fellowship. And so it's really important. So do your homework and master your craft. And so um, this is uh, everybody's heard this uh, paper. And so this was very much popularized by Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers in the 10,000 hour rule. And everybody's heard the 10,000 hour rule. But the details are probably most people, many people don't really recognize that. And so the 10,000 hour rule was said that if by 20 years of age you put in 10,000 hours, and you are to become a master violinist or pianist, you are more likely statistically to become a professional or good enough to be a professional. That's what the 10,000 hours. And that wasn't the most important thing in their, in their article. And you can see that uh, they quoted, uh, Malcolm Gladwell quoted a number of different uh, folks who became experts, Bill Gates, the Beatles, et cetera. Uh, but then the author of that paper, Anders Ericsson said, Gladwell sort of got it wrong. He sort of stressed the 10,000 hours. The most important thing that came out of that article was this concept of deliberate practice. And so what is deliberate practice? It means you're constantly pushing yourself and you're evaluating every time you do an activity, you're evaluating what you're doing. 
And so most people haven't read the article. This is the article. And that's the title of the article, The Role of Deliberate Practice in the Acquisition of Expert Performance. This article is about 30 pages long. It's got an incredible amount of data. And this is some of the data, and this is what Malcolm Gladwell sort of concentrated on. And these are two graphs. One on the left is for, uh, for the violinist, and to the right is a pianist. And you can see the 10,000 hours by 20 years of age. If you got to that point, you're more likely statistically to become an expert in, in violin or piano. Uh, but the most important is deliberate practice. Why is that important for us? Well, it's important for us because as you're in the operating room, really kind of understanding what you're doing and uh, looking back and sort of reflecting on that uh, and uh, debriefing is really important. Why do I show this picture? Who are these guys, residents? This is your first pin question. Blue Angels, right? Why am I showing that picture? Mm -hmm. They're expert pilots, yeah. What else do they do, Richard? Right. What might they do after the show? Right. So they do a debrief. How long is their show? Have you ever been to one of their shows? How long do you think their show is? Oh, you want the short version, I guess. So, <laughs> huh? Yeah, yeah. So typically their shows are about 45 minutes. And so, so one of our residents uh, flew in the Navy. He didn't flow, fly these planes, but he flew a big cargo plane. But um, so we got sort of back street, pa back uh, stage passes to a show. And, and so this is when my boys were real young. And so we went and we listened, uh, we watched it. And then afterwards, we got to hang out with the, with the squadron. And then the squadron leader, after 10 minutes or so, said, hey, guys, come on, we're going to go debrief. So, oh, debrief, that's interesting. And so they do a debriefing after every show. And so the shows are 45 minutes. How long do you think they debrief for? Richard, it's unfortunate. I know your name, so I'm going to pick on you. But how long do you think they debrief for? Exactly. Exactly right. And so an hour and a half. So they debrief for an hour and a half. And what they do is they tape every show, and then they go over the tape. And I said, so I asked the squadron leader, I said, what, what are you doing You know, when you say debrief? And he said, well, we tape every show. And he said, did you notice that uh, during one of those aerial um, uh, moves that one of the guys didn't have their smoke on? Like, I didn't notice that, you know? So they go over every step of the way. How long is the debrief? Okay, Rich, I'm gonna pick on you again. You do a surgical case, let's say you do a two hour surgery. How long is your debrief afterwards, typically? Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> it's very brief, right? Yeah, maybe 30 seconds, right? And so not that you should necessarily be longer, but Think about what they do. And I think it's just a model. You obviously can't do a two-hour surgery, do a four-hour debrief. I mean, I guess you could, but but you really want to spend time debriefing and really learning. And so in 1998, when I was done with my fellowship, I went to uh, spend time with Reinhold Gans in Switzerland and, um, you know, the, the, the place of the PAO. And at the time they were doing, how many PAOs do you think they were doing? I need a, I need a chief resident. How many PAOs do you think? The, the place where the Bernese osteotomy was created. If take a guess. Where's the chief resident? Any chief residents here? How many? Yeah, they did 30 a year. Okay. And so, right. I would have guessed exactly the same, right? And so um, they did 30 a year. And, and the reason that's important is they squeezed every little piece of information out of every case. Gans was doing, he'd operate on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. He was never trying to do, you know, 500, 600 cases. He was doing a fair amount of cases, but they spent a lot of time kind of talking about everything. And, and he was an incredibly slick surgeon, maybe the most slick surgeon I've ever seen, um, but they just garnered every piece of information out of every case. And they were doing a debriefing along the way. And so I think it's really important uh, to do that. And it's not easy, you know, in this hustle bustle world of uh, North America, we're, we're always moving on to the next thing, but you need to take time and debrief. Uh, and recognize that a great team is necessary. And that's why I showed that picture. You guys obviously have a great team. Uh, and John Wooden, uh, this is uh, for the young folks. You probably know John Wooden, but he was the basketball coach for UCLA. They won 10 titles in 12 years. And he said, and he'd never considered himself a coach. He considered himself a teacher. And he said, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, you need a team. And obviously that's really important. And see, these are some of the best teams of all time. And interestingly, the most successful team of all time 
was the University of Connecticut women's basketball team, which you guys probably know already. And so you're very fortunate to work with teams. And so I'm very fortunate to work with a ton of different teams at our at our place. And these are just some of the teams. And uh, everybody has a role. Everybody has an critically important role in recognizing that it's really important. And this is some of our nursing team who are uh, unbelievable. And these are some of the sort of ancillary, let's call staff. But these folks are just as important as, as uh, anybody. Uh, and I consider our 1,100 employees to be part of the healing team. And you can see at the center there, that guy's name, Ronnie Prater. He's the head of our, he's not the head of our security, but he's the most popular security person we have. And uh, he's the first person everybody meets when they hit the hospital. And Ron is just a, a great ambassador for, for the hospital and for our patients. And, and so are the rest of the folks pictured here. And so that's really important. See, these are some of the principles for team performance. And I'm not going to go through them all, but vision, again, continues to come up. You have to have something to really believe in and something uh, to become. You have to have really talented people, high-functioning individuals who are team players. Again, John Wooden, and I apologize for all the John Wooden things, but if you ever get a chance to read or, or get involved with uh, the things that he's done, it's fantastic. He says, a player who makes a great team is more valuable than a great player. Losing yourself in the group for the good of the group, that's teamwork. And that's, uh, and that's really important. You know people who are super talented, but they don't play well in the sandbox. And those are not the folks you kind of want on your team. Communication, listen to each other, respect opinions, gauge progress, Goal focused, agree on clear goals and timelines. And that's really hard. <clears throat> Excuse me, hard. What's the biggest fallout for a strategic plan? What's the biggest fallout that happens? 90% of them fail because of one reason, execution. And so agreeing on clear goals and timelines is important. Morris Chang said, without strategy, execution is aimless. Without execution, strategy is useless. And so execution is really really where the things fall out. And so this is one of my favorite books of all time, The Four Disciplines of Execution. Uh, and it's really a very dense book with great examples. Uh, but basically the summary is uh, here to the left. You have to have a wildly important goal, uh, the WIG, and then you have to have lag measures. So a big lag measure. So if you say you wanna increase access, we wanna increase access to UVA. Uh, and so you gotta have a lag measure. We wanna increase it by 50%. And you have to have lead measures. You have to have weekly things that will accomplish the lag measure. And you have to agree on those and everybody has to understand those. And then you have to go after those. And then you have to, what's probably the most important thing is you have to have a cadence of accountability. And in this book, they really focus on a weekly and that sometimes is difficult to do, but you certainly have to have some sort of cadence everybody agrees to, to say, what do we accomplish in the last, whatever it was, week, month, uh, what didn't we accomplish? Why didn't we accomplish, uh, accomplish that? And then everybody has to be accountable to each other. And what's the biggest problem with the cadence of accountability and achieving these? They call it the whirlwind of our lives. So we leave a place, we go back to our life, and we get into sort of that whirlwind of our life, and we lose focus, and we lose this cadence of accountability, and then things sort of fall apart. And so that's in a nutshell, and it's a great book, and it takes a long time to get through it if you really want to kind of take notes and really understand it completely. And so accountability is really important. I'm a Bills fan, but unfortunately, I have to show it. this guy, Bill Belichick. He says, do your job. And in that is a really deep understanding. Do your job. The person next to me should do their job, and if, they, if that happens down the line, then you can move the organization forward. And so recognize what your job is and do your job and, uh, and everybody has to be accountable to each other. Um, we'll talk a little bit about leadership and then a cohesive team moves the team forward. And obviously that's really, really important. And so this is the original dream team in 1992. And so incredible talent in the room. And during their first game, they lost to a bunch of uh, group of college players and Scotty Pippen said, we didn't know how to play with each other. And they adjusted and obviously the rest is history and they didn't lose another game and they never lost a game by, it wasn't even close. Uh, and they won the 92 uh, gold. So I, I think this is a really important thing, hiring for life. When, if you have an opportunity to hire people, you really have to hire people that will uh, don't hire early, don't settle, don't uh, don't feel rushed. If you're six months into it, still a job posting and, and you don't have, haven't found the right person, that's fine. You can deal with it. What you can't deal with is somebody who's not right for the team. And so uh, we kind of, and I look for hard skills and soft skills and, and the things that are teachable, specific and ability are the hard skills. And then the soft skills are the communication, the listening, the empathetic, uh, and those sort of things are really important. Uh, and uh, so call it, I sort of, the other thing we call it, or I call it is talent plus, you know, you got to have talent for the hard skills, 
but you need somebody who's going to be the foxhole test, who's going to be uh, uh, deep in the in the foxhole with you. That's going to uh, move the organization forward. So the hard skills as a surgeon are those listed, and the soft skills you got to play well in the sandbox. Someone who wants uh, you want in the locker room, the foxhole test, and you don't want a complainer. You want somebody a problem solver. And so people can look at a variety of different things in a, uh, various ways. Uh, and this is a, a quote from uh, Jim Stockdale. So Jim Stockdale was the admiral in the, in the Vietnam War, who was a POW for eight years. Uh, and his team was, uh, was uh, POWs. And uh, he realized that it was a very, very tough battle to get out. Uh, but he led his team uh, and they finally, after eight years, were released. And he said, what separates people is not the presence or absence of difficulty, but how they deal with the inevitable difficulties of life. And you know this, right? So in orthopedics, you know, taking call is not much fun sometimes. Uh, but if somebody takes call and they take the same call, two people, they may have two different outlooks on that. And so when I was a resident, uh, there was a resident uh, who would go unnamed. Every time he was on call, he had a black cloud over his head. Right. And so uh, finally, as a chief resident, uh, he was my junior and, and we were in a level one trauma call and we were up all night operating. And it, of course, he told the story on how difficult it was. But I finally turned to him and said, this is a level one trauma center. This is what we're here for. This is I mean, there's not a black cloud. We're just busy because the level one trauma center. So finding those people who can turn something that seemingly is difficult into something uh, positive, I think is really important. This is my team. And so this is part of my team, my nursing team. And so uh the uh the the person in red there is a specific example that I, that i always give because uh we were looking she's an lvn so we each have we have an lvn that we share with another staff and so um i've been looking for an lvn for probably three months and and uh our head of nursing kept coming and saying listen i got another good one you want to interview him so i interviewed him and said no it's not the right person and so i went for probably six months and he was really getting on my case. His name was Charles. I said, Charles, listen, I'm, I'm just, we just got to wait for the right person. So Katie walks into my office and I interviewed and it took 30 seconds to realize she was the right person. That was 16 years ago. And she's been awesome since, and she's an LVN. She, she basically functions as everything uh, for, for the team. And so having fun on the team is also important. So this is during the holiday time. We showed our Christmas socks. So this is not what you want. So George Carlin, for the young folks in the crowd, he was a comedian for years ago. He said, most people work just hard enough not to get fired and get paid just enough not to quit. And that's not what you want to have. You want to have a, a much more positive environment than that. Uh, leadership is a very uh, popular thing today. And I think there's lots of leadership courses. Uh, POSNA has one, SRS has one. Uh, other organizations have had them for many years before that. Uh, and I think it's an everyday thing. Uh, as a physician, you are automatically recognized as a leader. And so you have to act each and every day like a leader. And this is this is probably the best quote I've heard on leadership. Joanna Chuella, who's an author and educator, she said, leadership is not a person or a position. It is a complex moral relationship between people based on trust. And trust is probably the most important part of leadership, obligation, commitment, emotion, and a shared vision of the good. So the people around you have to trust you. Uh, and that trust is built every day. It's not built uh, by sitting in a meeting and talking about leadership, in my opinion. It's by leading uh, uh, every day and uh, doing it from the trenches, meaning you know, you're in there with the people that you're leading. Uh, and I think, to me, I always think of this because it's short and it's sweet and no one works for you as a leader, you work for them. And so if you're in the operating room and the folks who are uh, taking care of the patients with you, you're, you're the leader of that team. Uh, and you have to earn it each and every day. And so um, so if you're a healthcare provider, you are a leader. The power of good morning and insert their name. So as a physician, as a surgeon, you know, if you're walking down the hall and there's a whoever it is, uh, it's a, you know, a quick good morning. And if you know their name, it's even better. Lead by example. Take the high road in every scenario. And so there will be stressful times and try to take the high road. None of these things are easy and we all fail. And so this is not to say that we all do these perfectly every time. Uh, developing talent around you. And I think that's been shown here. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Abel is the uh, chief of pediatric orthopedics has obviously hired great people around him when he was uh, uh, leading it. Managed performance. That's really uh, also very difficult. Hard decision making. And so hard decision making is very, very difficult. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, as the chief of our place, have to make uh, uh, decisions along the way. And those decisions aren't necessarily great for Dan Sicato. They may not be great for somebody in my team, but they're great for the organization. And again, going back to the why, why are we here? What's our purpose? 
uh, is sometimes the best way to kind of get to a good decision that people at least understand why you're making that decision. They may not like it, uh, but uh, they hopefully they respect it. And culture building is every day. It doesn't happen. You can't do it once a week. It's got to happen every day. And again, I think some of those things are really important. And John Wooden said a leader's most powerful ally is his or her example. These are all simple things and uh, they obviously make sense, but it's not that easy. So I, I in those seven questions, uh, this was uh, incredibly, um, I, I felt uh, very much in tune with what Mark said in one of his questions, who's your inspiration here? He said, I'm inspired by many people. The list would include the woman who cleans the operating area, Lily, who shows up with a smile every day. And when asked, how are you? She responds, I'm blessed. And I think this is a perfect example. There's a guy, so at Children's, when I'm on trauma call, there's a guy, Michael, he's a senior guy. He's been probably there forever. Every time you come out of the operating room, he's sitting there ready to clean the room. And if you don't know Michael's name, and if you don't know that he's a huge Cowboys fan, but he grew up in Maryland um, as a surgeon, you haven't done your, your job. And so Michael's cleaning that operating so that you, you're ready for your next case. And I think this is exactly uh, the key to uh, leadership, and it's the key to you know, creating great culture at an organization. Billy's still right here. Is she still? Good. So she's still black. That's awesome. Be a lifelong learner. You know, you're going to learn a ton in residency and fellowship, but you have to lifelong learn. And it's really, really important. And so um, I, I have everywhere I go, I learn and it's always exciting. You come as the, as the person who's giving the talk, but really just listening. Uh, I learned last night from the cases that were shown. I learned from the folks here when I first was here uh, the last time, 10 years ago, I just became chief and Mark and I sat down for probably two hours and he gave me a lot of wisdom and, and it's always important to, to learn. And so I spent time with Gans. So this is 25 years ago. So that's what I looked like 25 years ago. And that's, there's Gans picture to the right. Uh, and so, as I said earlier, I went there to learn PAOs. And so this was 1998, right on my fellowship, went there to learn PAOs. I'd seen them before. I spent some time with Mike Mills. Somebody at my residency was doing them, but I, went, I wanted to go to the place. And so I went there to look for PAOs. And during the first week, the schedule was up when I arrived. There were no PAOs. I was there for seven weeks. There were no PAOs, but there was this thing called hoofta subluxation. What's a hoofta subluxation? Surgical hip dislocation. So this is 1998. The paper was written in early 2000s in terms of surgical dislocation. So it opened up a whole new world to me. I can use a surgical hip dislocation for a bunch of things in pediatric orthopedics. And so um, it was just a, it was a phenomenal experience. And if you ever get a chance to do traveling fellowships, traveling anything, going visiting other people, it's really. I just called him up, and the first time he actually denied me, he said, "You only have six weeks. I can't teach you how to do a PA in six weeks." So I had to call him back uh, and he literally hung up the phone. It was very traumatic to me as a fellow. And so, and so I had one of my staff who knew him call and say, listen, you know, he's, he's a pretty reasonable guy. And so anyway, I called him a little while later and he let me in. And so, and it's been a great, uh, it's been a great relationship. That's the other thing. It's a great relationship. I just wrote a chapter with him in a book that's going to be coming out in the next couple of years on central head resections. Uh, and so it was great to reconnect with him and connected with him. I was there, I, I visited him four times and he visited our place two, two times. And it's been a great uh, experience. I also went on the Scoliosis Traveling Fellowship uh, and, that, and, and really kind of developed lifelong friendships, not only uh, locally, but internationally. And I think these are very difficult. This is three weeks. Uh, and some of the, the other, some of the fellowships are six weeks. It's very, very difficult um, to do this, especially if you have a family. Uh, but uh, you know, it, it is worth it if you can do it and, and try to take that advantage. Um, and the last is complications and complications are really, really tough. Um, and if you're a surgeon, when you go out into practice, uh, Richard, when you go out into practice, when you first go out into practice, you're not going to have complications until you have complications. And that's really what happens. And so you think, God, you know, my attending Scott, I would never have that complication. You're going to have those complications and it's tough. It's tough on the patient and it's tough on you. And I think it's very difficult to, to be able to manage them. So Oops, let me hold off on that for a second. Um, so the National Transportation Safety Board looked at uh, all the plane crashes. This was several years ago. And, you know, when you have a little turbulence and where you have a problem and they looked at and tried to say, how, how can we improve on what we've learned from these crashes? And so there's decisions that get made along the way that in the end either keep the plane up or plane crashes. So how many bad decisions on average did they discover? 
making a bad decision results in a plane crash. Anyone take a guess? And anyone know this? No, how many how many decisions? Leanne can't answer because she heard this talk over the weekend. Five, not bad guess. Anybody else? Seven. So seven bad decisions. So the point is when you have a complication, and unfortunately I've had complications, that's not that important. What's most important is the next decision. And you can see cases that go down a road of bad decision and not great decision and not great decision. And now you're in a real pickle and a real problem. And so that is as important a message as I can tell you. Uh, and I'm going to show you a case here that still will bring emotions to me because of the complication that happened. Uh, but it, it sort of shows you, uh, and uh, I like to air dirty laundry because I think you can all learn and I've learned from this particular case. So this is a boy with uh, Escobar syndrome. And so he had previous surgery uh, and you can see his radiographs, you can see his CT scan there. So you can see he's had a previous fusion and he was becoming, he's got pterygium in his knees and really challenging. And his name is Owen. And he's a great kid and he's just a fireball of personality. Uh, and he was becoming myelopathic because of his deformity. Uh, and so we ended up doing a vertebral column resection. His spinal cord monitoring didn't have good baseline data because of his myelopathic scenario, uh, but it didn't change. And he actually woke up the exact same neurologically. And then he subsequently, um, we were waiting to see what he would do. So this, this was the day of surgery, he got his x-rays. And then three days later, post-op, you can see on that left chest, he's got a big hemothorax. And so this was on a Saturday. Scottish Rite Hospital is an orthopedic hospital. We're not a full-service hospital. So we don't have general surgeons and, uh, you know, the, the full-service ER docs, et cetera. So it's a Saturday. And so, and I've placed lots of chest tubes. So the chest tube is not the issue. So this was the team. There's an attending anesthesiologist, senior nurse, junior nurse, scrub tech, radiology tech, me as the attending surgeon, the fellow orthopedic surgeon. The fellow actually happened to be a fellow who had done internal medicine. So he was a, he was a real doctor as opposed to the bone doctors. And so uh, he was a great guy. And the uh, circulating nurse was the nurse that ran our PALS course. Just happened to be so. And the attending anesthesiologist is a young very qualified, outstanding anesthesiologist. And so what happened was he said, how long will this take you to place the chest? I said, well, it doesn't take long to place the chest. We've got to get an x-ray and make sure it looks good. If the position's not great, then we may have to kind of readjust. So maybe take 20 minutes or so. So he said, well, maybe I'll place an LMA. And then he said, no, nah, I think I'm going to intubate the patient. So he tries to intubate the patient, couldn't intubate the patient. Then he paralyzes the patient to try to get them to relax. And he couldn't intubate the patient. And then you could hear the oxygen saturation dropping, dropping. You could see him getting a little bit more nervous. You could see the whole team getting a little bit more nervous. And so he tries to intubate. And at that time, there was, you know, there's a lot of secretions. And there was, he was a tough airway because Escobar is a tough airway to begin with. Um, and then he coded. And most co codes in children are respiratory. And that's exactly what happened. You know, just ox oxygen satur saturations dropped. So we started the code and he, you could tell he was really not in a good place. He, the patient and he, the anesthesiologist. And so we said, well, listen, let's call, let's uh, just as he was starting to code. So let's see if we can get another anesthesiologist because there's a few anesthesiologists that live close by to the hospital. Um, and uh, the one who lives really close, she was out of town. And so they tried to call another anesthesiologist. In the meantime, then he coded. And so in the, in the sort of the stress of the code, you know, we're, doing everything uh, appropriately, and he still can't intubate the patient. And uh, at one point I, I asked, do we get a hold of that second anesthesiologist? And that second anesthesiologist was standing right next to me. And what happened was she was going down the street to go to lunch with a bunch of friends. She happened to be right in front of the hospital. She pulled in, she intubated the patient and the patient survived. So, the first complication was the chest tube. The second complication was a big, big deal. And we probably weren't set up exactly right to, to get that, to get, take great care of that patient. And so that day after he survived, uh, we had a debriefing and we sat there for two hours and said, what, what happened here and what can we do differently? And so since that time, because we're not a full service hospital, if we ever go in on a Saturday to do a case, there's always two anesthesiologists. There's always, uh, everybody's now credentialed to do PALS, and uh, we haven't had that event to happen again. Now, it certainly could happen again, 
But uh, anyway, this boy's name is Owen. And so I'm going to show you the rest of his story. So, uh, so we got his chest tube in and uh, he went on to do fine and actually became ambulatory. And then six months later, he appeared in this uh, commercial that was run uh, on Super, during Super Bowl, during the Super Bowl, and I'll show it to you. So that was Owen six months later. So, so anyway, my last in conclusion, these are sort of things, and there's certainly many things, and I, I hope to learn from everybody here. Be grateful for the opportunity, have a plan, do your homework and master your craft. And that's really important for the residents. Recognize that a great team is necessary. If you want to go far, go with the team, hire for life, pick the right people for your team. Leadership is an everyday practice. The complication management is really, really important, and you're going to have complications. Uh, I have one permanent neurologic deficit in my career, and it derailed the patient, obviously, uh, substantially, and derailed my life for six months. Uh, and it's really important to learn from complications and be a lifelong learner. Go to places, ask questions, uh, be humble in how you do that, and you'll learn a lot. So thanks for the opportunity, and it's, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Next question. Take notes. But I'm sure you. Know, I, I didn't forget to mention he's also president of the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of America, so he's definitely those leadership roles. Um, so it's great to hear from yeah. between that and your Scottish life where you've seen everything. What's been your most difficult like employee challenge? Yeah, I think HR issues. Uh, <laughs> Uh, probably the most challenging things is the time the thing you spend the time the most on. Um, it's tough. I mean, I think you need to spend a lot of time with the people, uh, and and you know you've got to build a lot of a lot of in your relationship because when it comes crunch time, and some of the folks are you know, friends of yours, and so um, you know we've had I've had some um, you know issues where. You know, it just doesn't make sense how people behave. And so you have to sit down and, and you got to do it in a positive way. And I think one of the ways to introduce um, sort of getting to, to begin the discussion is says, are you okay with a little feedback? And I start out like, are you okay with a little feedback? It's a good day for a little feedback or something to that effect to kind of break the ice a little bit and give them feedback and say, here's, here's, here's the scenario and here's how I see it. Uh, tell me what you're, you know, tell me about it. Uh, and, and it's, you know, we're all human. We all don't act you know, the way we should at times. And so, uh, but if it's a consistent behavior and you have to kind of, just as important as hiring is sort of firing. And it's not easy to do, but sometimes you have to get those people off the bus because the A players sniff out the B and C players. And if you don't get them off the bus, it's just it's a little bit of a cancer. And so it's tough to do, right? It's very difficult. And you don't have to do it that often, fortunately, because we're surrounded by great people, but that's really, really it creates a culture that is not positive. And you as a leader don't do that. Uh, and I'm guilty of all these things, by the way, and that's why I've learned is that, um, 
and, and things sort of slowly drift. And things don't happen quickly, slowly, culture drifts slowly, you know, organizations drift slowly over time. And it's those things that you got to sort of stop that drifting because if that continues, then, then you're not in a good place. So I think you've got your talk too, you know, be careful hiring. Yes. Yeah. Really important. The firing is hard. So hire the best. Yeah. Um, that was just an absolutely phenomenal talk. Thank you very much for sharing your years of wisdom. You know, I um, get asked frequently because I was thrust into leadership at a young age, but I get asked by residents and young faculty, I want to be a leader. I want to be a leader in orthopedics, leader in academic medicine. How do I be a leader? Hmm. And I often say anyone can be a leader, but what is your response to a question like that? Yeah, I'm a sort of a little bit, um, I'm a little bit struck by the sort of the organized leadership thing. I think those are really important. Uh, yeah, I can tell you that this is a good year that done leadership course, and the course is amazing. It's great. It's uh, I first participated as a faculty. Not, I'm not one of the main faculty, um, but I can tell you that there are people that sit in those rooms that listen to it and kind of tell a nice story, but day to day are not acting like a leader. And so, if you don't act like a leader each and every day, and that doesn't mean you're bossing people around. It just means by your actions, you know, then. It's very hard for me to recognize that someone's going to sit in a classroom and listen to a lecture and kind of tell stories that they're going to be a leader. So I think, you know, leadership is, you're not born to be a leader. I don't necessarily think I think you have some attributes to be a leader, but I think uh, you, it can be learned, but you also have to demonstrate it each and every day. And so I think to me, that's the most important uh, part of it. Uh, and then you learn by life experiences. I mean, the more things you do, each and every day, which don't necessarily seem like they're going to lead to good leadership uh, experiences, I think really important for the rest of there. I think people say, ask you to do something, I would say yes all the time, every time. The more experience you get in anything in and out of the hospital, and the, more, the more experiences you'll have in your life that you can then draw on. Uh, as time goes on. And that's also about building practice. Like if someone says to me, ever, you see this patient because I'm worried about their intoing, even before they ask the question, of course I can see him. You can add them to my clinic, of course I can. There's no reason not to say no. So those things are really important. That's leadership too. Yes. Thanks for that talk. That was, uh, that was partly back to the convention team. I worked with uh, Halo or the Gravity Traction. Yeah. Because, uh, my wife, uh, when I was a resident at the University of Michigan, my wife was the orthodontist there, and she was she it was the first person to do orthogravity traction. Uh, and reading some of probably your papers, was certainly Texas Scottish Rite, and the information about putting it together. Which, but my question is actually about leadership. Also, uh, you mentioned you you showed several books that you used uh, and quotes from, uh, and certainly uh, being a good surgeon and, and being effective in your field will sort of get you noticed. But being a good leader also takes, I think, intentional practice, as you mentioned. So what did you do as part of your intentional practice to be a better leader, able to be successful at this high level? Yeah, well, number one, I think we all recognize as leaders, you know, we, we make mistakes every day. So I don't, nobody should stand up here and say, I got all the answers. And I'm sort of the first person to say that. I think spending time and studying, uh, reading books is really important. Um, and trying to find something that um, really resonates with you and your personality, because there's a lot of leadership stuff and a lot of things that are written out there that are really uh, don't necessarily pertain to you. And so I think doing your homework is really important. I think uh, I'm going to harken back just to the same similar sort of answer in that I think each and every time you have an opportunity to, to interact with people is an opportunity to demonstrate leadership. And so in the operating room, you know, they work with attendings for your residents uh, that demonstrate leadership in the operating room. I mean, as a resident, demonstrating leadership in the operating room. Uh, getting to know the people around you is really important. You know, think about your career in orthopedics is really important. The scrub tech, that's a job for them most of the time. It's not necessarily a career. Getting to know what's important in their life is really important. So um, personal relationships and building equity into those relationships is important. Um, and so I think it's just an everyday thing and, and you're know, thrusting yourself into challenging environment to say you should each and every day put yourself in an uncomfortable scenario because then you'll grow and you'll be able to get better. And I think you have to do that, you know, standing up and giving a talk when you really are, you know, 
learning how to do it is, is hard to do. Put yourself in an uncomfortable scenario. I think it's, it's one of those things. All right. Go to the okay. next talk. Okay. Go right to it. Yeah, so good. All right. Well, um, a little bit more of the piece here. So, um, I thought, uh, I guess time. Okay, perfect. Okay. So, we'll talk about slip. So, I ran, I met Leanne, uh, we met Leanne because I met her last time I was here at uh, AMP over the weekend, last weekend. And, uh, she said, what are you going to talk about? And I told her the first talk, and then said, I got to decide what I'm going to do. find things. And I told her, she said, I would talk about hip things. And so, <laughs> so I'm going to talk about Skiffy's because I think most people, residents, you guys are going to interact and deal with this. So Skiffy is different uh, management today than it's been before. And the question is, is it better? And so uh, you'll run into stable, unstable, and then the healed Skiffy. And so this was um, an outcome paper that uh, came from the Mayo Clinic. Uh, and they looked at uh, patients uh, in the long term, and they had 146 patients just at 16 years. And so these are young, young patients. Uh, and 12% of them had reconstructive surgery. And of the remaining, 33% were, were painful, even though their hair SIP scores were actually pretty good and the UCLA activity score were actually pretty good. And so I was asked to kind of uh, give the North American experience uh, at the combined POSNA EPOS meeting and. 2017. And so I polled uh, 20 or so surgeons that do a lot of hip surgery and asked them a lot of questions. And I'll give you some of those results. But I think getting back to what I was saying earlier about being a good doctor, history and physical exam is really important. So if somebody comes in and this happens all the time, and actually one of our um, providers, uh, one of our nurse practitioners uh, missed a very subtle skiffy uh, and got presented an M&M, &M, uh, and there's really no bad sequelae from it. But they missed the history of saying, I have thigh pain, uh, I have knee pain. And on physical exam, they missed the fact that the patient has obligate external rotation. When you, so when you flex up a hip on a 12-year-old who's a, obese or a little overweight or maybe not even overweight uh, and has thigh pain and they, obligate, they have obligate external rotation, that is you can't flex them up and them being straight up in neutral rotation, then they have a skiffy period. You can get the x-ray because you have to get the x-ray, but they have a slip. And so good old fashioned history and physical exam are really important. Um, and then imaging, you have to get an AP and a frog leg pelvis. And so here's a patient who had a stable slip, was pinned beautifully with a single screw. And then, and we were talking about this earlier, this patient comes in with hip pain subsequent uh, to uh, having a slip and a pinning. And so they have impingement. And so they get a surgical dislocation, which probably could have been done through the hip scope. So you can see the screws and just had uh, no osteotomy except for just an osteochondroplasty. And the patient had much better uh, range of motion. It wasn't perfect. And you can see that the joint space looks pretty good. And overall, this patient will probably do pretty well, at least in the short term and maybe midterm, probably is going to have some problems later on. You can see the body habitus and the soft tissue envelopes a little bigger. And these patients oftentimes don't do that well. And so we we're talking about, could you take care of these arthroscopically? And this is where hip arthroscopy, I think today, uh, and I don't do hip arthroscopy. One of our sports surgeons, Henry Ellis, is our hip arthroscopist and does an amazing job. And so partnering and being a part of that team has been really important. And so you can take care of these patients who have impingement after a slip, either arthroscopically or through the surgical dislocation approach. Uh, the surgical dislocation approach is actually a very clean and neat uh, operation that patients do very, very well from if you do it well. Uh, they are on crutches a little bit longer because of the trochanteric osteotomy. Uh, so what are the indications for osteotomy when you have a stable slip and you have residual deformity? Um, and these are really more severe deformities that you take care of. It's a fairly large operation. Uh, and the, the total joint arthroplasty later can be a little bit more challenging because you're creating osteotomies that make it difficult. And so here's a patient that came, had a pinning. You can be a very severe slip. And so uh, I did, this was way back a long time ago, we did a Southwick osteotomy, which is sort of a valgus uh, flexion osteotomy with a blade plate. I love blade plates. Looks pretty good, but not great. You can see, look at that lateral x-ray. Look at how much lack of offset there is on this right side compared to his left side. 
And so he had a surgery for his pinning. He had a surgery for the esophagic osteotomy. You can see that blade plate's a little too posterior. Uh, his head survived that despite that. Uh, but we took out his blade plate and then we did a uh, osteochondroplasty. You can see on his uh, lateral x-ray, he looks much, much better. And again, this hip is going to do pretty well in the short term, but it's not going to be a long-term solution. He's going to have problems. Well, what about a patient like this? Here's a patient that came, clearly had a slip that was never recognized on the left. And now his uh, severe deformity on the left and deformity on the right. And I don't know if his video is going to run. Yeah, so his video, unfortunately, is not going to run. Uh, but the way he walked is basically what you see there is that his legs were excellently rotated. He did about 30 degrees of hip flexion. You could see his body habitus, but really, really severe. And so there's no way you can do an osteochondroplasty and make sure everything's going to be okay. It's just not going to happen. And so I ended up doing staged. Well, maybe the video will work. No. Nope. So here's here's his deformity. You can see the, the left side is healed. The right side is still has a, uh, the physis is still open. But you can see the amount of deformity that he has here. Look at the femoral neck here. And you can see the femoral neck isn't bending. This is all sort of healed callus because he's trying to heal it. But posterior, the hip is, the epiphysis is posterior. And so he's healing the bone posteriorly. And so we did bilateral flexion osteotomies, the sort of Himhauser procedure. Uh, and there he is uh, postoperatively and after he's healed. And now he walks better. And you can see, uh, I couldn't show you the pre-op x-rays, but now he walks better. He's not perfect, but uh, he walks much, much better uh, than he did uh, preoperatively. He's a great kid. He's a big boy, obviously. Um, and so, but osteotomies have problems. And this was a summary of, uh, of papers that looked at what happens with osteotomies. I mean, trying to get these patients in a good position after they've had a pinning is very, very difficult. You can get osteonecrosis, you can get uh, chondrolysis, you get all kinds of problems. Uh, and so those are very challenging. So what about this uh, procedure that Gans really wrote up about, which is this uh, uh, done osteotomy? Um, and what are the indications? Uh, and so doing the osteotomy through the physis risks blood flow to the, to the femoral head. And so you have to have a level of expertise. And again, this goes back to uh, mastering your craft. And so if you're going to learn a technique, you should probably go see the, for the person that created it or somebody that's doing it very, very well. Uh, and you have to have some interest in uh, you and the patient in taking on some risk. There's no way that you're going to do this procedure a hundred times and get uh, not get a get away with not having iatrogenic AVN, unfortunately, especially early on in your experience. And so uh, there's a certain amount of uh, risk that's taken on. And so severe deformity and complications from previous treatment are the really indications uh, and the level of, of expertise that you have. And so here's a patient that presented to me had a pinning of a slip. And you can see that the epiphysis is nowhere near where it's supposed to be. And so this is a real challenge. His head looks okay. So we did a surgical dislocation and done osteotomy. And you can see that he has a little bit of partial head AVN. His head is no longer round perfectly on that AP x-ray. His joint space looks pretty good. And actually, interestingly, this kid has done very well. I've seen him for 15 years. And he's still doing pretty well. He has occasional pain, but overall doing pretty well. But he's much better than where he was before. So that's an indication. Pretty rare uh, presentation of a, of a slip. And so here he is uh, before and here he is after. But again, you can see that superior femoral head is not great. But his range of motion is actually pretty good. His joint space has been maintained. And he's overall doing pretty well. Here's a patient of mine. So a stable slip on the left side, we pinned it with a single screw, which is a treatment. He's a big boy, as you can see there. And two, almost two years later, you can see that he's still having pain. And on a CT scan, you can see that he's not healed. And that's not terribly surprising, given the fact that he's a big guy and his uh, slip is very severe. And one single screw sometimes is not enough. And so for this guy, you know, you could do an Imhauser. You'd have to do probably 90 degrees of flexion, which is really not po possible in an Imhauser. So we opened up his hip and we did a done osteotomy and did the, the surgery through the growth plate. And overall, he's done very well, again, in the short term, short term meaning five, uh, eight years uh, post-op. Sometimes patients present like this. This is a real challenge, right? The pinning and then the kid walked on it maybe early. Uh, although for pinning of stable slips, I think they can walk on it right away. You can see he already has a little bit of joint space narrowing. And so this is really challenging. So again, this is a really good indication in my mind for opening up the hip and working through the physis. So we shortened the neck, we got to the screw, took out the screw, and then we uh, put, it, put two screws in. And, uh, you know, his joint is much better. His joint space is still not great. Can't restore his joint space, but you can put at least put his head in a good position. So I think those are the indications. They're pretty uncommon for a stable scenario. 
Uh, although today, I think, and we'll talk about this in a minute, that I think for a stable scenario, uh, this is a stable slip on the left. He also has a slip on the right. So for the residents, always know that you need an AP pelvis and you always have to look to the other side. Don't get sort of tunnel vision on one. And that's true for everything. If somebody has a diagnosis, as Lori Carroll, uh, who unfortunately passed away, was one of the leaders of our in our society, first woman president, she used to say, you can have ticks and fleas. And so uh, you can have two diagnoses. And so you can see here that uh, this patient had a, a stable slip. And I think there's a great indication today. To me, done osteotomies actually has a greater indication for the stable slips compared to the unstable slips. And you can see that, that uh, this patient had a done osteotomy uh, as defined by modified done osteotomy and then had a in situ pinning on the right side. And so what really came about uh, that's been very, very helpful for us is really monitoring the femoral head. And so you can put a pressure sensor ICP monitor through the cannulated aspect of this screw, or if you're opening this hip, you can put it in the center of the femoral head or wherever you want, several locations through a small drill and put it through the center of the head. And then you can measure pressure, which hopefully is a surrogate measure for blood flow. And so you're going to see here in this next video, sort of what we like to see with the waveform, uh, which is pictured in orange here. You can see the orange waveform. And so the way to test to make sure that you're actually measuring blood flow is then to put your finger on the retinacular sleeve where the vessels are, and you can see that the waveform goes away. So you get a nice waveform, let your finger up, and then you can see that the waveform comes back. And I think that's a good way of saying, you know, at least in that spot where you're measuring the pressure, that there's good flow to that femoral head. And you can check it a couple different places. So I think this has really changed the landscape of how we treat it because we can check where you put that epiphysis, is it in a good place, and is the blood flow still good? So uh, unfortunately, though, subcapital realignment through a donosteotomy has not always worked out. So this is Chris Peters, who's an accomplished hip surgeon in Utah that had a small series that reported 17% AVN rate. And so when it goes bad, it goes really bad, right? And then we call our adult colleagues to kind of help us out. And so, but I think this is iatrogenic. And I think as you gain experience, uh, you won't have AVN, uh, especially with all the tools that we're using today and all that we've learned. And others have shown similarly uh, that they've had uh, AVN. And so Jim Kasser, who is the chief at Boston Children's, uh, asked his team to look at their experience. And so now there's one particular surgeon whose results are much, much better than somebody else. And so that person has to be in the operating room anytime they do a done osteotomy. And this was published some time ago, but I think that that still holds true, which points to the fact that, you know, there are many papers that look at two different techniques of surgery. Um, and, but you have to know who's actually doing the surgery. And so in spine deformity through the harm study group, one of the best papers I, I think that's ever come out of that, is that uh, organization that study group is looking at results and complications. And the primary predictor was the surgeon, right? And so uh, this was a lot more relevant when he was actually playing well. But I don't know, Jordan Spieth, if you guys know Jordan Spieth, he's a professional golfer. He's from Dallas. He was, he's won three um, uh, majors uh, early in his career, and he's it's been downhill ever since. But uh, unfortunately... Uh, but he and I, I don't know him. I met him once. He and I at one point played the exact same irons, Titleist AP2s. And that's where the similarities end, right? <laughs> he used the same club, but the difference between the that, that face of the club hitting the golf ball for him using the same tool and me using the same tool is completely different, right? And so think about that, right? And so as a surgeon, mastering your craft and being sure that you're the surgeon that has to be in the room as opposed to the other surgeons in the group that, that, that can't do that surgery on their own. And so that's really important. So for my opinion, for stable slips, for reconstruction options, understand the deformity and the complaints. Osteochondroplasty for mild loss, I think works really well, arthroscopically or open. For moderate deformity, I think an Imhauser flexion osteotomy is important. And then the done is really for severe deformity. You need experience and you need to monitor the femoral head. Well, what about unstable slips? And so these are the two complications, AVN and femoral acetabular impingement. So an unstable slip, I know for the residents, just as a review, an unstable slip, this was written in 1993 by Randy Loader and Steve Richards, who used to be part of our group, is retired, wrote this, um, what, what to find an unstable slip. And so 
Unstable slip means that the patient basically is acting like a hip fracture. They can't go from point A to point B on their own, whether that's with crutches or whether that's with uh, holding on, they can't do that. And so that's an unstable slip. And the reason that's important is that the AVN rate, when they wrote it, was 47%, which is probably not true. There's some editorial things in that uh, JVGS article that uh, decreased the denominator. So if patients didn't have a long enough follow-up, they were pulled from the from the paper. And so it, it artificially increased the percentage of, un, of skiffies. Uh, either way, though, it's much different unstable versus a stable slip. And so AVN is our most feared complication and of course femoral vertebral impingement. And so what are the long-term results of slip capital femoral epiphysis? They're not that great. And part of it is because the deformity is uh, still present. We looked at our 20 year experience uh, and patients who had neck, head neck offset uh, was a predictor of not a very good result. And here's what their scores were. You know, a lot of them, 50% of them were excellent. If you had the goods on there, which probably good is probably not that great, um, is, uh, you know, it's basically a 50-50 shot for unstable, uh, for slips in general, a 20-year experience. This is Harris hip score uh, results. And so this is a perfect example, a relatively mild slip. And you can see over a 20-year period, that hip goes pretty bad. And these patients are still in their early 30s. And so can we do something uh, different and improve that? Can we take a, a mild slip and make it uh, near anatomic? Uh, the other part of this is that we looked at this and published this, uh, forget how long ago, this was probably 12 years ago, uh, 2015, so not that, not 12 years ago, eight years ago. And so we had 64 patients and we wanted to look at long-term outcome. Well, the biggest challenge with these patients is their health outcomes. And so again, trying to partner with our medical colleagues to get these folks in better shape would be important. But 72% were obese, BMI above 30 uh, but we showed uh, that these patients aren't doing that great over time. And some of that is because of this mechanical damage. This was written up by Michael Loinig. And so you can see the damage in the femoral head uh, that happens with mild, moderate, and severe. This was actually a finite element analysis that was done by George Reb uh, years ago. Uh, and then Michael Loinig uh, looked at it in patients. And basically, the more deformity you have, the more that metaphysis is banging up against the acetabulum. And this is what it looks like in mild, uh, moderate, and severe. And so you can see when that metaphysis is exposed, then it's going to cause a lot of damage in the, in the acetabulum. And he showed that in these radiographs uh, as part of his paper. <clears throat> and so here's a patient of mine that he had pinned, he had been, she had been pinned, saying elsewhere, and a uh, pretty mild slip, but it was an unstable slip, single screw, and went on to AVN. And you can see the really severe deformity. So what happens? Why does this unstable slip result in a vascular injury? And when does it occur? Is the time of injury? It's very, in my opinion, it's very rare that it happens at the time of injury. Does it happen during a surgical hip dislocation? Well, surgical hip dislocations for not skiffies, if you do a good technique, is never gonna result in an AVN. Uh, so it must happen during the reduction. Um, does the intraarticular hematoma play a role? Probably. And so given those facts, how do we make this uh, procedure safe and how do we get a good reduction? This is a very interesting paper. This was selective angiography that was done in a Japanese study. And you can see when the hip is displaced, when the epiphysis is displaced, there's not much flow to the femoral head. When you put it back, there is flow that returns. And so there's probably a fine line between how much to reduce it back to make sure that the femoral head is reduced nicely without losing vascularity. This is a very interesting article by Klaus Parch in Germany. He's now retired, uh, but he had 64 consecutive cases over 20 years. His AVN rate was 4% using his technique, which is an anterior uh, approach to the hip. He pushed the metaphysis so that the epiphysis would reduce, and he had a very low incidence of avascular necrosis. If you look deep in their article, and this is one of the things that I'm gonna to add to my list of things to learn. Don't be a headline reader. When you read papers, the abstract may say something, but dig deep into the data because the devil's always in the details. And so uh, this, in his article, he only had three out of those 64 patients had a BMI above 30. Compare that to a North American experience, much, much different. And so, you know, the technique has merit, but also different patient population. Having said that, uh, Kai Zebarth, who's now uh, at in Bern, Switzerland, um, he is uh, at the Children's Hospital there. He and the Boston group uh, wrote about 40 patients who had both stable and unstable slips, and they had a 0% AVN rate with the modified down procedure, which I just showed you before. And so, you know, those, those are pretty stellar results. Anytime we read about no AVN, 
the first thing you have to think about is the 41st patient may have AVN and then the statistics are definitely different. And so you got to be careful about uh, reading that. Um, and then Tim Schrader was the one who really documented intraoperative monitoring of epiphyseal perfusion with the central head resect with the um, uh, ICP monitor that went down the center of the screw. And overall, uh, pretty interesting results. He had 13 unstable and 10 stable uh, patients and he monitored them. And he made the big uh, push to um, really justify doing a capsular decompression. Uh, I actually reviewed this paper for JBGS when it first came through, and uh, I was a little skeptical about some of the results because the second time he released the capsular, um, capsule that uh, he restored blood flow, and that was in 50% of the patients in unstable scenario, and it, that's not been my experience, but the technique is very, very viable. So what about AVN? If you took all the papers and you looked at all the papers, you can find a paper for anything that you want to do. And so if you have an unstable slip and you want to do a surgical dislocation, you can find a paper, which I just showed you, that is 0% AVN. If you want to do in situ pinning, you can also find a paper that says 0% AVN. The highest is 29% uh, from these uh, papers down here. And then the loader paper is 47% for in situ pinning. If you combine them all together, and this is what our results did, that the AVN rate for both techniques is probably about the same if you look at all the papers. So it's about 20%, one in five patients. Uh, but we probably can improve on that. I think in situ pinning can be improved and, and we'll talk a little bit about that. What, what about surgical dislocation? And just very quickly, surgical dislocation approach, I'm sure you, uh, you have good experience here with doing it. It's a very straightforward procedure. It's written up by Gans years ago. And so you take off the trochanter with the vastus, the medius and the minimus. And then you do a Z capsulotomy, and then you can open up the hip. And so here's a case of mine. And so we open up the hip. This is an unstable slip. And so you can't see the epiphysis. And so with the hip capsule open, I have my index finger on the epiphysis, and I'm sort of uh, uh, estimating where it's where that uh, epiphysis is. And then under fluoro, just pinning the hip, because the next thing you're going to do, do is dislocate the hip. And so you want the epiphysis to obviously come together with the metaphysis as you dislocate the hip. And so here we are dislocating the hip. And these hips are very difficult to dislocate because the kids uh, are all a little bit retroverted. The epiphysis is obviously way posteriorly. And when you pull off the hip, here's what it can look like. It could look pretty mild like this top picture to the left, or it could look pretty severe like this picture to the right. And you can see that the metaphysis is very much exposed uh, here. And then you have to take down the retinacular sleeve and so here's a picture after we've taken down the retinacular sleeve. So here's a trochanter here, here's the epiphysis. And you can see we've taken down the retinacular sleeve so that we're, we have this home in behind the femoral neck and the blood flow is coming back here posteriorly so that you can then displace that epiphysis and you can clean out the physis and you'll see here that uh, you, you displace the epiphysis. And then you have to trim the neck so that you can put the epiphysis back on under no tension. And so uh, Gans hates when I show this video because he doesn't think you need to shorten the neck, but I always shorten the neck a little bit, always take down that medial and posterior callus. And then the epiphysis you can reduce anatomically. Uh, and that allows you then to get the hip in a good position. So here's some more pictures of that. You scrape out the physis, you reduce it. And then you have to, because these kids are big and the hip is dislocated, it's very difficult to anagrade pin it. So you got to pin it retrograde, which is always gives us the heebie-jeebies because we don't like to pin through articular cartilage, but here we go. Uh, and so you got to bring it out uh, laterally and, uh, and, and you can do it on thinner patients. And you can see that we're bringing it out uh, laterally and then you got to cut it close uh, to the articular cartilage. Um, and then you almost reduce the hip, but you don't want to reduce it all the way because you have this uh, pins in the in the head. And then you just got to pull them back a little bit. And then you drill, over drill them, and then fill them with screws. And you should always have two screws. If you pin a unstable slip, and this is a board question, if you pin an unstable slip, you should always use two screws. If you just do an inside two pinning. It's very, very unstable. And so you should always pin with two screws. So here we are just filling the screws, measuring them, putting a regular guide wire in so we can measure the appropriate height uh, of the screw or the length of the screw. And then we place fully, th uh, here we use partially threaded screws, interestingly, uh, but you should use uh, a fully threaded screws. And then we monitor the flow and you can see in the orange there, we've monitored the flow. And again, we'll put our finger on the uh, retinacular sleeve and watch that flow go down and make sure it's good. So here's that patient. <clears throat> And you can see he's got a slip on the other side. So we pin that also. What about this? What's the diagnosis here? 
the residents, what's the diagnosis? Bilateral slips presents like this. What's the one thing you should check? Let's say he's pretty young. His tray rate cartilage is open. What underlying condition may he have? Yes, good. What, what endocrinopathy? Okay. What other one? Much more common, pardon? Yes, hypothyroidism. So this young is a girl, actually. She presented with severe hypothyroidism, so severe that the anesthesiologist understandably wouldn't put her to sleep. And so she actually remained in a wheelchair for a couple of weeks before she her thyroid was normalized. And then we, we did a surgical dislocation on both hips, and she did uh, very well. So very quickly, um, I'm going to skip this just for the sake of time. Bad things can happen. And so here's our complication rate from our first uh, experience. We had 16% AVN rate. You can see some screws broke, small screws broke uh, with surgical dislocation approach. Uh, we fixed those. Here's a patient with AVN. We we're pretty um, critical with our AVN, had mild AVN, overall did pretty well. You can see the AVN right there, but overall was doing pretty well. So we have an ongoing RCT that's been going on for almost uh, 13 years now. Uh, sorry, 15 years now, 2008. And so it's very difficult to do an RCT, inside two pinning versus open reduction. We've had a number of patients not enrolled. So you can see there's 67% were enrolled. The data is too early, but uh, I would say that the AVN rate is going to be better with the unstables. The position is going to be better with the unstables. Uh, but I think part of the issue now is that we're doing things a little bit differently, that you can reduce the hip, you can pin it, you can monitor the blood flow. And if it's good, you're good to go. If it's not good, we can talk about what you can do about that. So final thoughts, prevention is critical. And this is one thing for you, the residents. When you go down to the ER and you see a patient with a slip, probably the ER resident or the even the ER staff, the one thing you could do is teach them a little bit about anytime you go down there. We oftentimes moan about how the ER docs are not very good and, you know, and, and that's universal and I get it, but you have to remember that they're, they got to take care of orthopedics and, 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 you know, endocrinology and cardiac and all those sort of things. So be a good, be a good leader and go down and educate them about thigh pain and a 12 year old is a slip until proven otherwise or similar uh, knowledge. Educate your primary colleagues uh, about skips, skippies, um, because the unstable ones presented somewhere most likely before they become an unstable slip. And so educate them about that. We're moving in the right direction, I think. I think with greater surgical experience, we have greater out, better outcomes. Uh, monitoring is really important. And I think we need to continue to advance the science in orthopedics in general, and certainly this diagnosis. And I think large multi-center studies will be helpful in that regard. So I'm gonna stop there and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. We do have time for questions. Technical question. Uh, yeah, very young child, you're in an open dislocation. Uh, how do you do the osteotomy on fresh rope? Do you just not worry about you go through the devices and not worry about it in forest for more growth? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I, I think the short answer is don't worry about it. Um, we talked about this a little bit last night, you know, to do a greater inter osteodesis in a child who has some sort of you know femoral head spicial injury, but we refer to these, you know. You can only affect that positively with greater trophies if you do an osteodesis by shutting down the crisis by you gotta be less than 10 for sure. So if I'm doing a surgical dislocation, even on a young kid, the likelihood of that resting is pretty small. It's not just it's very big one too to arrest that. So we don't need that there's a child who was four who had a uh osteodactyoma and he just has to get so you go through the physis of yeah. the rest. It's not likely. Yeah. You said you use mostly fully threaded screws as opposed to partially threaded. Yeah. Is there, is there a reason for one versus the other? Well, well, number one, you don't you don't need to get you're not trying to get compression, and so it's, it's that's not necessarily the second part is to get the screws out. You know, with the fully threaded screws, much much easier than always stainless steel, and these are very heavy. Yeah, yeah. 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 I've always thought that a lot of these kids' problem is the retroversion. Yeah. And so when you're doing even a low grade slip, you're, you're fixing in site two, they still have a retroversion. Same with the you know, the resection, you still have retroversion. Yeah. Um, and we know retroversion is bad long term, but we still don't have enough evidence to prophylactically correct retroversion. Yeah, well, the retro, uh, yeah, exactly. No, I agree. The retroverted on the socket side, but to do something 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's not bad. And these patients don't do well in general. I'm going to bring up uh, Dr. Kui, also spent some time in Bern, and his, his specialty is research also is devascular necrosis mm -hmm. as well in the adult population. So I'm sure you have some similar findings, right? Yeah, you know, we, yes. Um, actually, I worked with a uh, uh, him. Yeah. Uh, I am on the same society for many years. Uh, we had a collaboration in the safety industry. Uh, that is my time, you know, uh, with the uh, arthroscopic uh, surgery technology available, I don't do surgical dislocation. Mm -hmm. um, but we do find, you know, in, in adult population, reward as, as a tablet, you know, severe deformity after a skip, it, it's just a challenging, challenging, yeah. challenging for you. Yeah. Yeah, challenging. yeah. But the AVA is definitely in case after surgery is a very bad complication, and we still don't have any good solution. You know, it's, I know it's tough. You know, we had a yeah. There is no great solution. So we had a case that um, had a this was a patient that had a hip dislocation, open vices, and it was taken care of by a very good orthopedist out of town, uh, outside of Dallas. Uh, took him to the operating room, tried to reduce it, reduce the metaphysis into the acetabulum, but the metaphysis stayed back. So then they got trained, they got air flighted in. And so we went that night to uh, operate on that kid to do the surgical dislocation. The retinacular sleeve was really a lot of tension. And we drilled the head, and the head didn't have any pressure monitor, didn't have any flow. And so we did everything. I mean, it really wasn't much to do. So we got to put it back, got together, you know, put it, it healed nicely, but it did have some early AVN. And we were very aggressive with that. So Harry, uh, and I took him, really, Harry did this, is to wash out the femoral head and try to get sort of the uh, debris wash out. Yeah, debris wash out. You can see in the syringes how things kind of cleared up. And, and that kid developed AVM, but not, not, not collapsing AVM. And this, that was seven years ago now. But it's, so his it, head is still doing okay. His hip is not normal, but he hasn't had it. I've asked this for national use. Is anyone injecting anything like scaffolding? You know, like sports does or subcondroplasty? Well, we just uh, got an energy grant uh, between Johns Hopkins, uh, Cleveland Clinic, and uh, uh, Stan Stanford. So we are doing motor center study. We're going to do bone marrow country on the early stage of osteonecrosis. If it works, it's going to work on the piece. You know, if you, you know, yeah. piece, uh, because population generally they have a much better. Uh, what about if you some type of scaffold? You know, like well, it's all about a blood supply. If you don't have blood supply, any scaffold you put in is not going to survive. Yeah. So that's that's the problem. So you have to do something biologic, not uh, any uh, anything, not you know uh, alive. But that <laughs> bone, bone graft, generally you don't. So you need osteoconductors. doctors. Yeah, well, to conduct it last year. Yeah, so I have a question for the arthroscopists in the room, just a bunch of us here. Um, we see a lot of folks keeping deformities in the teenagers, you know, early 20s, no types of things. When is, when is the retroversion of the deformity too much to correct just the femoral side of an osteoplasty? Because I'm taking care of a lot of these patients. We, we have a mild retroversion post acute deformity. You do a nice femoroplasty, and they do, they do pretty well. I've had a couple that's just too much. It's, it's, it's way too much to be able to correct. Do you have a guidance for that? Yeah, it's a tough question. I'd say that, um, you know, if you're measured like a Southwick angle above 30, that's probably getting to be too much. Um, and so, you know, in that scenario, where we'll, we do an Imhauser plus an osteochondroplasty open. That's probably the indication for at least to think about it. But many of the patients do very well. I mean, I think, Again, it's how much retroversion do they have on the other side too, and trying to really understand that. Uh, and yeah, both sides of the joint kind of is helpful instead of just looking at the femoral side. But I think 30 is a good number. Do um, I mean, you consider pelvic osteotomy at the same time to help correct some of that terminal? It's a different situation where there's so much that you're, you're not going to get it all on one side, but yeah. you could be able to put it in You know, we don't, I've never, yeah, exactly, I've never done it in this scenario. Uh, but it certainly makes sense. I mean, that, that's part of the challenge, right? You're going to do a big, big operation. You don't really know. You're changing the morphology, but then hopefully you're going to make the patient better. But that's a lot. And I'm not afraid to do big surgeries. I do a lot of PAOs, a lot of primal osteos. I've never done a prescription.
I don't think the deformity is that bad on the socket side. I have a question. What are your own personal take or your own indications for prophylactic pinning on the contralateral side? Yeah, that's a great question. I think prophylactic pinning, so probably the best data is, um, is I'm a little biased because it came from our institution, but John Birch and Debbie Popejoy wrote an article about you know using the uh, Oxford Bone Age. And really, the Oxford Bone Age is very difficult. You know, it's multiple things you look at on the x-ray, but in the end, most important thing is if the trirear cartilage is open or not. If it's wide open, no question you should pin it. If it's closing, that's where the, there's a little bit of a gray zone and sort of depends on a little bit of your perspective. Also depends on the, on the patient and the family, right? So we always talk about cases and we show x-rays, but there's so much behind that x-ray is the patient, family, are they going to be, you know, follow up? And so for sure, if the trirear cartilage is open, prophylactically pin do you ever look at age and obesity with these kids? It's a little on the obese side. It may not be young, but the pen. Somebody on the epsilon side is so bad. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good point. Yeah, again, many, many factors going into it. And so, you know, as you get experience, you sort of process that stuff and you're like, you know, you know what the right answer is. But yeah, that certainly plays a role. But if the try rate is open, you don't pin it, that's not the right thing to do. You should definitely pin the other side. And also realize that that's not an easy pinning. You know, pinning a slip is probably a little bit easier sometimes when it's severe because you start in the anterior neck and it's a little bit maybe straight, some would argue straightforward as opposed to starting very lateral, making sure you don't create complications. So there's a good paper from CHOP, the complication rate for prophylactic pinning is upwards of 20%. And so you gotta be very careful. AVN was included in that. so. You know, pass that pin right. You know, really think about organizing how you pin a slip. It's not that easy. Pro black. Yes, Rich. I have a question about um, with the flesh uh, monitors. I have to my head. Like, let's assume that you um, reduce it, pin it, put the screws up, and then you lose uh, pressure. How often are you able to get that back? Like, I guess taking out the screws, like, like kind of what's, what's kind yeah, of- Yeah, that's a really, that? that's a great question. And so two different scenarios. If it's open, you're doing an open procedure, it's a little bit easier, right? You can adjust things, you can pull the screws back, you can, maybe you've reduced it too much. <laughs> maybe you haven't taken enough posterior callus. So think about if you assume that every unstable slip is preceded by a stable slip as it's slipping posteriorly in the black callus, like it's trying to bottom try and peel. And so you got to take that callus down, you got to shorten the neck. So those are the problems with a total reduction. So you can adjust them right there. The bigger question becomes now as we start to monitor inside to pinning. So let's say you do people talk about the lap batter technique to reduce it as opposed to an incidental reduction, which used to be the way we used to do it. Now that we can monitor the head, we're being a little bit more aggressive. If you reduce it, put your two screws in, and then you don't have any flow. Now what do you do? Well, you can decompress the capsule again, like Tim Schrader talked about. That's one, that's probably the biggest, uh, most common thing to do first. The second would be, and I've done this on three cases, is that think about, and the Europeans use pins, by the way, for when they pin, many of them do. They use pins, and the, the reason they do that is because think about the epiphysis. It only has so much volume. And so the fluid has to, you know, the blood flow has to flow through there. And if you have two big screws, maybe the fluid dynamics are not as good in that and so that's why they use three or four pins in, in Europe and so if you back out some of those screws a little bit instead of having how many what's the right answer in terms of threads when you pin a slick how many should you have in the process five, five. yeah five would be ideal yeah. four is probably at least a bare minimum but you may back out two screws and and then all of a sudden you get a flow and that happened in three cases so I think that's one thing you could also do the third would be um, the position of the leg. And so when you're testing it, you might have to flex the hip a little bit and all of a sudden get a good blood flow because the dust is going to spasm and then you see that open and you also see that close. And so post-operatively, it might be important to kind of keep that in flex because when you pin a hip, oftentimes they're in full extension. So playing around with the hip uh, uh, is the first thing. Decompressing the capsule is the second. Third would be uh, backing out the screws. And then I've never had to do this because every when I've gone through those first three steps, I've always had good flow. Um, is opening the hip, which would be really, really, really hard to do. Great discussion. Thank you. Thanks, man.
some UVA ortho soy eggs around Texas. Yeah. I actually, uh, as you know, I did my uh, part of my fellowship at Texas Cash Right. Yeah. It's grown a lot since I was there, and it's a really special place. And you guys are doing a lot of wonderful things. There. Well, thanks. So, well, you are great. too. So thank you. Appreciate yeah, it. Please say awesome. hi to. I will. Dan, uh, Oishi yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I will. The crew there. Yeah. The crew there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I will. Great. So thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Appreciate it. Thank you.